county number 001, the county of Mombasa, which is a beautiful one and has a lot of promise and a lot of heritage in it and a lot to be told from here and stories and things that can spread beyond its borders. And we are right next to the beautiful Indian Ocean in the county of Mombasa and the sights are breathtaking. The wind just whistling by us is is a great, great reminder of where we are and the conversation we are about to have because our conversation is about the blue economy, how to harness the blue economy and we've got the relevant people here to speak to us about it from where they each sit and it's going to be an exciting conversation here um, at, the, at CAMFRI, that is the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute offices here in Mombasa and we are going to be having some questions as well from the audience here to just give us uh, their questions and thoughts on what this thing called blue economy is because we do appreciate that uh, not those who are here but generally um, in the country we have some people who may not be as conversant with what this is but we believe by the time we are closing this, uh, this program on NTV we're going to be having a clearer picture of what this is about. So I'm going to introduce my guests beginning from my immediate left and we have uh, Professor Professor James Njiru, who's the Director General of Chemfree, that's Kenya Maritime and Fisheries Research Institute. He's basically our host here today. Thank you for joining us, Professor. And next to him, we have Daniel Kiange, who's the Secretary General of the Intergovernmental Standing Committee on Shipping, or ISCOS. Thank you for joining us as well. And to my far right, we have Captain Geoffrey Namadoa, who's the Harbor Master and General Manager of Marine Operations at the Kenya Ports Authority. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you all gentlemen. And maybe I'll just begin with you, Prof. Um, just to kick us off, there are some, we don't want to assume there's the many who know what exactly Kemfri is and what it does. Maybe just give us a brief so that we can start getting to this conversation about harnessing the blue economy. Um, thank you very much. Um, as you just said, my name is James Njiro, uh, current Director General, uh, Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. It's not Kenya Maritime, it's not uh, Kenfri, uh, Kenya Medical Research Institute, and many more names. Um, Kenya Marine and Fisheries uh, Research Institute is a state corporation uh, enacted, established by the, uh, an Act of Parliament, uh, Science and Technology Act of 2013, which has since been repealed. Uh, our, main, uh, our main work is to, to do research uh, in uh, marine, uh, fisheries, uh, aquaculture, environment, and uh, uh, of course, uh, physical and chemical in the ocean. But uh, probably before I go to the next, uh, I, I want to say that we are under the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, uh, uh, livestock, uh, fisheries, uh, and uh, corporate, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, excuse me, of course, and then by Honorable Peter Munya, and we are under the state, uh, under the state department of fisheries, aquaculture, and the blue economy, ended by Dr. Francis Owino, and of course, the institute is led by a board of um, uh, management, uh, led by Honorable Jafar John Safari Momba, who is our chairman. Kenya Marine has several stations uh, spread all over the country. Uh, where there is a water, uh, we have a station from um, Trukana all the way to Naivasha, uh, uh, all the way to Mombasa. Mombasa is our headquarters, but we have other central stations. So our key uh, work as a, uh, an institution is to give information, is research. For the, um, we give information uh, for, in terms of exploitation of the blue economy. So ours is research for the policy and for management of the resources. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, Prof. My apologies. It's the Kenya Marine and Fisheries uh, Research Institute. And I want to come to Captain before I come to Bona Daniel. And Captain, um, who's at my far right, um, in your own estimation, especially being a person at the Kenya Port Authority, which is quite key to this blue economy, do, where do you feel we are at in terms of the country, in terms of harnessing the blue economy? Do you think we still have a long way to go, or do you think we are at a very bad place? What is your own estimation as a person who sits pretty much at the heart of the you know, blue economy conversation? Thank you very much. Uh, as I respond to your question, uh, let me start by saying that, uh, first of all, 
we need to understand what are the elements of blue economy. A blue economy is uh, one that has the ability to strategically coordinate and execute uh, fishing uh, activities, port operation systems, uh, dry docking and ship uh, repairs, um, uh, ship building, um, uh, uh, ship, uh, ship, ship uh, breakdown and recycling. So looking at those few elements which I've mentioned, uh, I will comfortably say that as I start, uh, Kenya is at a good stage. We are progressing so well. And remember, the government uh, uh, took it uh, it's upon itself to ensure that uh, there is a state department, Department of Maritime Affairs, that is responsible for matters pertaining to maritime, which are related to the blue economy. So in a nutshell, yes, as a Kenya government, uh, and as a country, I think we are at a good stage and we started quite well and we are progressing well. Okay, and I want to bring him uh, his course um, because you deal with more than just Kenya. When you look at Kenya vis-a-vis -vis our neighbors, um, where, where, do, where do we stand? Are we, are we leading the pack? Traditionally, we've been you know, the economic powerhouse of the region, so to speak. When it comes to the blue economy, are we leading or are we you know, somewhere in, com in, in stiff competition with some of our neighbors? Uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, I just want to, before I respond to your question, kindly let me introduce this course, because probably some of the members here or listening to us may not know who, 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 what is this course. Uh, ISCO stands for Intergovernmental Standing Committee on Shipping. It is a committee comprising of four countries. Uh, that's the Republic of Kenya, the uh, Republic of Uganda, the United Republic of Tanzania, and the Republic of Zambia. The organization was formed way back in 1967, mainly to promote, uh, coordinate, and protect the shipping and maritime interests of the member states. We are now trying to grow in numbers. We used to operate as four countries, but now the country in line of the greater integration principles uh, is now trying to grow in the region. Uh, we are currently targeting the regional members. Uh, actually, in March, we had an assembly of ministers in Uganda and Tebe, which was attended by 12 countries. And these countries signed a memorandum of uh, intent through resolutions to work together in area of collaboration. So, East Coast now, we are mainly in the area of all the space of transport, maritime shipping, and also advocacy. But now to come to your question, where I see Kenya in regard to the region, uh, I think Kenya is well placed in terms of blue economy exploitation, because I remember 2018, Kenya hosted the Blue Economy Nairobi Conference, which actually gave birth to a number of initiatives in the country. And I believe when I look at Kenya, from that initiative, the government of Kenya went ahead and established a full state department, uh, the state department of shipping and maritime uh, under uh, uh, Nasi Gargidu, PS, and of course the Minister of Transport and uh, uh, PS uh, uh, James Macharia. The rest of the countries, when you look at them, they are still trying, but in terms of where we are, I think Kenya, uh, from East Coast point of view, is still ahead because it's they put up the State Department. Majority of other countries are still not at that level. Okay, before. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I'm told there's a bit of a challenge with the microphone, and as we address that, my apologies. Um, <coughs> we'll get back to you in just a bit. Um, I just want to come back again to, and this is a question really to 
all three gentlemen, and he's alluded to it. In 2018, there was the huge forum on the blue economy that Kenya hosted, and it was, you know, touted as a landmark, you know, a, a very significant one. Since then until now, what, what, what fruit of it have we seen playing out in your individual institutions? Maybe we begin with you, Prof. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think let me start with your question where we are in Kenya in terms of blue economy. I think we are number one in, in Africa. Uh, let me say why. Uh, one, <coughs> I think um, in terms of uh, momentum and in terms of leadership, there's no other country in Africa which has led from, from the front. Uh, starting with our His, His Excellency the President, uh, Uru Mugai Kenyatta, who one is uh, the patron of the Ocean Decade Alliance, I'll be coming to that later on. Uh, he's also in the high level panel uh, in terms of the, uh, of the ocean issues, I'll come back to that later on. We had a kickoff meeting in uh, Egypt last week uh, where I was able to, to attend and uh, we have a, a, road a roadmap in terms of uh, what we want for the ocean. Since 2018, November uh, 2018, actually 2016 when we had uh, the ZEBEC, what we call the Sustainable Blue Economy, I think it was the first in terms of it in Africa, actually in the world. The first uh, sustainable blue economy was held in, 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 um, in Kenya. It, it, it was the first. And uh, that's the leadership again, which was uh, led by our Excellency the President. We had about 178 leaders coming from all over the world. And the idea uh, which was brought to Nairobi, of course we came with uh, what we call the, uh, the Nairobi State of Intent, uh, Statement of Intent, was to bring the issue of blue economy uh, to our doorsteps. And uh, it was first, the first time not, uh, in Africa when such a uh, uh, symposium w w was held. And uh, we are picked from there. And uh, as I've said, um, the UN also in uh, its uh, 75th Assembly uh, impl asserted implementing issues of the uh, blue economy. And, and what it did allow me to, uh, it, uh, it task what we call the IOC UNESCO. IOC UNESCO is Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And uh, the umbrella of, uh, uh, in, under the umbrella of the UN, what IOC does is to bring countries together. We are about 150, uh, sorry, 150 countries uh, under the, the, the umbrella of IOC. And the idea of the IOC is to coordinate and to implement issues pertaining to the ocean. Uh, uh, because ocean is one. We don't have two oceans. When we talk about Atlantic, uh, Pacific, at the end of the day, the ocean is one. So the UN saw it's, uh, it's uh, good or important to, do, to, to, to go that way. And uh, I want to say that um, in terms of the institutions, in terms of our institution, what we are doing, we are an executive member of the IOC UNESCO. Uh, I sit in the board, and uh, our ambassador in, uh, in Paris is in the board. Uh, and uh, we, we, we are able to form in terms of policy issues to influence policy issue in terms of, in terms of the ocean. But as a research institution, we have done a lot uh, in terms of um, informing the world uh, and probably we'll be coming back to this later on in terms of what we are doing. Because as I said earlier on, our role is to inform in terms of uh, information so that the government and also the, the, the world at large is able to implement policies, uh, uh, laws based on facts and that is our role as an institution. And that's what we have been doing. Uh, and um, allow me to say that in the next 10 years, uh, the, the, the UN also, through the IOC UNESCO, declared uh, the 10 years as uh, what we call the ocean decade. Of, uh, the, the, the ocean decade. We call it the, the decade of um, ocean science. And the decade of the ocean science, I'm very happy that, that uh, now we are bringing this to the fora, that um, ocean are very important. And uh, you have brought this um, conversation next to the ocean. And I want to tell you what you are breathing, the oxygen you are breathing, 50% of it is from the ocean. And uh, if the ocean today was to die, uh, probably we'll all be dying, we'll all be dead. And the conversation we're having today, uh, and, uh, as, my, uh, as, uh, as our institution, as my institution, our institution, is try and uh, reverse what is happening in the ocean. The ocean has a lot of benefits in terms of food, in terms of climate change, but the ocean is a danger. And if this is not, is not uh, reversed, uh, probably in a couple of years to come, and uh, we are all seeing what is happening with the climate change. 
the ocean is the greatest buffer in terms of climate change. And when you destroy the ocean, we are destroying ourselves. So as a research institution, we'll be talking later on what we have done in terms of mitigating the climate uh, using the natural based uh, system and others like uh, planting of mangroves. Thank you very much. Right. So um, I also want to just come to, to Captain Pass just to tell us since that 2018 forum, what exactly, uh, you know, what, what, what have we seen that's tangible out of that playing out at the KPA? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, as I answer your question, I'll give it from national approach, not just KPA. Uh, from the time we had that forum, uh, three to four key elements of the blue economy have been uh, implemented by the government. First and foremost, uh, we've been able to upgrade uh, the, the former Bandar College to now an academy in order to uh, enhance uh, human, uh, human capacity as, as far as maritime trade is concerned. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, since then, the government has been able uh, to, to, to have to have the Kenya Coast Guard services. Why? Because that is very key. As we start uh, developing as far as the blue economy is concerned, we need to safeguard the resources. And the resources are all outside the Kenyan territorial waters. So the key thing, first of all, was to secure the resources. And that's why the government moved, first of all, to have the Coast Guard in place. Then, uh, recently, the government has set up uh, uh, a shipyard, Kenya Shipyards Limited. What does this mean? It has now brought to the local level that we are able to construct our own shore-going vessels, sea-going vessels, so that we are providing both uh, employment and also providing uh, revenue to the country. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. From, from the East Coast point of view, um, did that forum bear much fruit that is tangible for you and you know, for, for your stakeholders? Thank you. I, I hope my mic is now OK? Yes, yes, it's OK. Yes. Uh, from that uh, conference of 2018, I think uh, as East Coast, we, we, we have picked a number of issues, mainly at the regional level. And as I mentioned, ours is mainly anti-fiscal uh, advocacy and research. And therefore, what we do at the regional level in terms of the blue economy is that we bring together a number of stakeholders. We are not regulatory, but we have the mandate of coordinating the region. So we have set a number of forums where we bring together a number of stakeholders, mainly to deliberate, discuss, and agree on how to do shipping and to coordinate other related activities. We have a forum, for instance, for the maritime administrations in the region. This forum brings together all the maritime administration in the region. Uh, for instance, Kenya, we have Kenya Maritime Authority. We have uh, TASAC in Tanzania. Uh, Uganda, we have a direct department is responsible for that, Ethiopia and other people. So what these people come to do is to come and discuss in the issue of shipping and uh, logistics. Shipping is part and a key component of the blue economy. Because as we are aware, is that over 90% of trade in terms of volume goes through the oceans. So if we don't protect through regulations these oceans, then we are killing ourselves, as uh, the professor said. And therefore, these forums come together to look at what do we do, how do we harmonize the regulations that govern operations of uh, shipping and trade in the region. We have a forum for the, um, for the uh, maritime training institutions because we want to build capacities for the future generation and exploitation of the blue economy. So we bring together Bandari Academy, 
uh, Dar es Salaam Academy and other academies in the region to discuss even the universities what is it for the region, the employee economy, how do we prepare ourselves to get full advantage of this particular economy. And as the captain has said, I think, not the captain, sorry, uh, professor, going forward, due to climate change, the countries that will develop are those who are going to exploit the blue economy. Because now we can no longer rely on rain agriculture. There is a lot of uh, uh, on and off of the rains, but the water is there. And if we take good care of the waters, then we can e actually be assured of our food because through research we can be able to do such things. So we have created those forums. We also have a forum on security, which brings together uh, security agencies like Coast Guards, uh, Marine Police, and the rest, just at the regional level, to look at how do we ensure that we are able to carry cargo across the region, and at the same time, we are able to ensure security. We avoid things like pollution, uh, because ships actually carry a lot of fuel, and if that fuel finds its way in the oceans, then that is a disaster. So these are some of the things we are doing as a region, and even moving at the continental level to see as Africa, how do we coordinate, collaborate uh, in terms of the blue economy. I mentioned the forum we had in Entebbe, which brought about 12 countries in the region, because we need to look at ourselves as a region. Uh, the professor said that the, the ocean, there's no boundary. So whatever happens in Kenya has an impact in Dar es Salaam, has an impact in Mozambique, and therefore we must think regionally. We must think globally if we have to survive and exploit blue economy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And gentlemen, I just want us to again go back to what I may call the basics, just so that we again do not assume that we are all in this ship and we are all in the same place. Many times when people think of the blue economy, <coughs> the thought of what job opportunities there are, I will just think of many people just think about working on a ship or you know, a lot of the jobs that have to do with the port. Maybe Prof could tell us what other opportunities have been coming up that many may not see as an opportunity as a result of the blue economy. Uh, thank you again. I think, um, let me start, even if you, di you didn't want to hear about the jobs, I think they are very critical. And um, I would want to, want to see what the government has done. Again, uh, again, the president has led from the front in terms of uh, enabling this institution uh, to train young Kenyans. And uh, he gave us uh, an order to train 1,000 Kenyans every year. Uh, we have trained now about 300. Uh, Kenyans, uh, we are planning to train another, um, as you speak today, today, <coughs> young Kenyans boarded to go and be trained. Um, and um, the problem has been, in terms of the ships we flag, I mean, we give license to Kenya, we have no crew members. We have been importing labor from West Africa, uh, 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 Seychelles and other countries. And allow me to say, to give you a, a scenario <coughs> very quickly in terms of why jobs are important. These crew members who uh, board the ship, in a month we, they earn about $100, uh, $100 uh, sorry, about $1,000. And uh, in six months, uh, uh, that's about 600 or uh, whatever, you multiply that. And if you have 1,000 of them, <coughs> you can see how much uh, they will get. And if you have 5,000, 5, we, we are seeing this can bring about five, uh, almost 6 billion Kenya shillings only on employment. So it's very key, so it's very key. And we have been lacking this. So those who have been coming here uh, and, and uh, exploiting our resources have been coming with crew from other countries. And we have we are young Kenyans, we have no jobs. So that's a plus in terms of blue economy and in terms of our government. The other areas where uh, we, 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 we can uh, get advantage in terms of blue economy, of course, is a community. And um, we, as a research institution and as a country, we have been engaging the community very closely. Like yesterday, we are in a, a place known as Gaze, uh, uh, in Bamba, in Kilifi, whereby our researchers are engaging in what we call uh, uh, in arid and semi-arid areas and growing of fish. So we are taking the knowledge to the, to, the local, to the local communities. We have been working with other communities like Kilifi, Dabaso, 
mostly made of women and uh, young men, whom we have taught or now to, to farm fish uh, so that they, 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 they can be able to uh, sustain themselves. So there are also those opportunities in terms of uh, farming fish, in terms of mariculture, and it's not only on fish, we have other things like prawn, shrimps, and the rest. Uh, cucumbers, which are very high level in terms of uh, in terms of price. If I go back to uh, again uh, in terms of uh, uh, grooves, we which you probably will be talking about later on. Again, there are very many opportunities. What we are doing as an institution, uh, led by our chief scientist known as Dr. Cairo, and he's the first in in, in the world to 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 involve communities in terms of uh, what we call a carbon uh, uh, carbon credits whereby we allow the local community to plant trees, not to, not to destroy the trees. And they are given about 2.5 uh, million Kenya shillings every year. And this money, they use it for their own children in terms of books, in terms of infrastructure. Very many opportunities. Now we have moved to Vanga, we are moving to Lamu. The money has increased in a, in a blue, uh, Vanga blue forest from uh, 2.4 million to 5 million. These are opportunities in blue economy, which we did not, we did not see and uh, which can change the life of the local, uh, the local Mwanainchi, the local person uh, 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 at the coast. So apart from those jobs, there are many other opportunities. And as such institution, we are at the forefront in terms of provision of information, uh, uh, which, which is uh, forming, uh, which uh, is very key in terms of policy in this, in this country. All right, thank you very much. And um, one thing also, remember when we covered a Blue Economy Forum, in Kisumu, there was also the fashion and beauty space because you could see people who are coming up with, you know, attire from fish skin and and you know the shells and the like. So it's a broad it's a broad one as well. It's one that you know um, <coughs> is not as um, as appreciated, I believe. You know, it's a lot of potential, as all of you would agree with me, but not um, exploited as it should be. And uh, Daniel, I wanted to find out from you because you said that you largely are on the advisory part, you know, um, especially for you who are in the shipping and you know the logistics space, so to speak. Um, what what happens when there is lack of political goodwill, you know, because it's a it's such a collaborative thing, you know. It's Kenya will not act in isolation when you come to crossing borders. You know, as much as the ocean is one, you said if it affects Kenya, it will affect Tanzania, ATC. So one of the things about, you know, harmonizing the policies in the different countries so that they can, so we can have a common goal. But what happens when there is no, you know, political goodwill from one of the partners? I, I think uh, uh, if whenever we lack uh, political goodwill in any of the, the countries, it's a risk for disaster. Because, as I've said, uh, we cannot uh, act independently to harness and exploit the resources effectively. Therefore, ours actually as a region is to, one, advocate and devise and pray that uh, our leaders uh, in high authorities will be able to hear the cry of Mwanainji for collaboration. Because if Kenya, for instance, decides to do their own things and mess this ocean, which is behind us, then the effect of that will go all the way to Tanzania and probably even to Seychelles. And therefore, uh, lack of uh, goodwill or politico political goodwill is not something we should like to see. Thank you. All right. And you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say at a point it, it is left to prayer. You know, we pray that, you know, um, the, the leadership is going to give the political goodwill. And I think one of the things that having covered for myself, having covered, you know, matters to do with the East African region for years, one of the concerns consistently had been about, say, Tanzania, not playing ball. You know, um, has this also, you know, affected, hindered some of the, poli some of the advice that should have wanted to give to the different governments? Uh, I think uh, currently we do not uh, have any problem with Tanzania. There could be have, there could have been issues in the past where probably the relationship between Kenya and Tanzania, particularly at the ESC, uh, was not very good. But uh, fortunately now, particularly under the new leadership, 
of um, President uh, Samia Slo and the Uhuru Kenyatta. I think the working relationship between the two countries has been super, and even those who have been traveling across, those who maybe do business uh, or travel across the borders can attest to that. The relationship between Kenya and Tanzania now is very good. There are no issues even at the borders. And the, even Uganda, uh, for the first time for a long time, I'm happy to see East Africa community talking in one voice. And I think that's the way to go. All right, thank you for that. Um, Captain, from the KPA standpoint, um, you know, again, I'm trying to help demystify, you know, perception that KPA is largely about those big containers that we see and the likes. Um, at Mombasa especially, but KPA has been moving to other, you know, uh, you know, setting up projects like, say, in Kisumu, there's a lot of uh, the great plans that are there. Um, what, what, are some of the, what are some of the opportunities that you see this growth by KPA uh, creating for the communities around these different ports that are there? Uh, th thank you. Uh, as you correctly said, uh, people have always uh, associated KPA with the Port of Mombasa. KPA is the managing body. Uh, we now have two commercial ports in Kenya. Uh, that is the Port of Mombasa and the Port of Lamu. Um, the mandate for Kenya Ports Authority is to develop, manage, uh, develop, operate, and manage uh, scheduled and gazetted ports. Now, recently, I think it was in uh, 2012, that was expanded to include the inland waterways, which therefore means like the Lake Victoria, all the ports within the Lake Victoria, which there are about 13 of them. Uh, most of you just know the port of uh, Kisumu. They previously were under Kenya Railway Corporation, but they are now under Kenya Post Authority. So, with the presence of Kenya Post Authority at the lake and far north now uh, within the Lamu County, that has changed the lives of people within that area. Let me start with the Lamu. You're all aware that the, His Excellency the President commissioned the Port of Lamu last year in May. From the time the port of Lamu was commissioned, a lot of social economical activities have really improved. Land that used to go for about 300,000 has shot up. To get land around the port of Lamu, ranging from Peketoni, Hindi, you'll be very lucky if you'll get land going for less than 6 million right now which indeed means the presence of Kenya Post Authority within Lam County has made property to go up. Talk of the connectivity to the other parts of Kenya. Three to five years ago, going to Lamu was a nightmare. You'll think twice before you think of going to Lam County. Right now, the roads have been so well done, courtesy of Kenya, uh, Kenha. Now you can move from Port of Mombasa to Port of Lamu within four hours. In other words, you can go to Lamu in, from morning and in the evening you are back in Mombasa. So that's the second thing that the presence of Kenya Post Authority has done as far as Lam County is concerned. Talk of the direct benefit to the locals in Lamu. Upon commissioning of the port of Lamu, the government through Kenya Post Authority recruited over 100 staff or personnel from Lam County. That is a direct impact on the persons or people within the county. 
as it is right now, Kenya is putting up more uh, better connectivity between the port of Lamu and the more hinterland, as far as Kenya is concerned, connecting all the way up to South Sudan and, and, and Ethiopia. Going the other side, on the side of uh, uh, Kisumu, Kisumu, we will all appreciate that before Kenya Post Authority moved into the lake region, there were no activities within Lake Victoria. Now, we are able to move wagons between the port of Kisumu and Entebbe and the ports in, 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 in Tanzania. We have now a capacity of 800 uh, TUs within Kisumu, but as the government plans to connect the SGR to port of Kisumu, we have a target of 6,000 TUs to be within the port of Kisumu. So this is also going to improve uh, the local or uh, the domestic uh, uh, industry in as far as work direct employment is concerned. And because of the presence of Kenya Post Authority and therefore the harbor operations, uh, the Kenya shipyard has also collocated itself within the port and they have been able to construct two very good crafts that are able to conduct a business between the uh, lake ports uh, within Lake Victoria. And of course, as I said, uh, KPA has now plans to uh, develop and operate all the other smaller 12 ports within Lake uh, Victoria. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And um, a lot of insights coming here just in terms of the opportunity. Oh, you wanted to say something on that? Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Captain. Uh, I want also to take this opportunity to sincerely thank KPA. Uh, I was in Kisumo recently, and when I compare the port of Kisumo, the way it is, and the way it used to be, there is a lot of change. Uh, last week we had a big forum in Kampala. We do run a uh, stakeholders forum for trade facilitation and shipping for inland waterways. One in Lake Victoria and another one for Lake Tanganyika at the moment. We of course we are planning to go to other lakes like uh, Lake Tukana, Lake Kifu and the rest. And therefore what KPA has done in terms of infrastructure and by extension the government of Kenya is commendable. And I think that is the way to go. Fortunately, even in the other countries at uh, the region, uh, equally investing a lot in the area of infrastructure. Uh, for instance, in Uganda, there is a new facility uh, coming at a place known as Kauawi, uh, where we have Maathi, Maathi uh, Infra is doing a lot of, a very big uh, storage uh, for fuel, with I think a capacity of uh, 70 million or so. And they have done two big ships. These ships are supposed to be flying between Kisumu and the uh, 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 Maadi region, and also Mwanza. And also Tanzania. Tanzania also are doing very well. They are both on building new ships. Uh, they have to already, I think, about three ships which are operational, and there's also another one under construction. So what that tells us, at the regional level, people are not taking lightly the issue and the resources and the potential of the blue economy. And therefore, what KPA and the rest of the government agencies are doing to invest in, in Kenya is commendable because at the regional level, we'll be able to exploit the resources of the blue economy uh, as a region, and that is very commendable. Right. So, regards, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we'll take a short break on this live broadcast, on this live forum, coming to you from the county of Mombasa, county number 1001. We'll be back after this short break as we continue to delve into the issues to do with the blue economy and how to harness, and ha harness it, and also just with the opportunities that are there 
across the board. Stay with us. Choose boldness. Celebrate the skin you're in and dress with confidence with Nivea Nourishing Cocoa Body Lotion. The triple layered care of deep moisture serum, precious cocoa butter, and vitamin E enriches your skin for 48 hours. Choose to wear your skin with pride with Nivea. Oresha maisha na bima. Maisha haya tabiriki. Huenda kukawa na pandashuka. Iwapo utashindwa kulipia bima yako malipo ya kila mwezi, usiwi na wasiwasi. Zungumza na kampuni na yokupa huduma za bima ili ubadilishe bima yako kuwa bima iliolipi wa tayari. Huta hitajika kuendelea kulipa malipo ya kila mwezi, japo kampuni na yokupa huduma za bima, bado itawajibika kukulipa faida unaustahili katika chaguo hili. Pata bima ili kuakikisha yote yatafuwa sawa. The International Day for Women in Maritime is a day established by the International Maritime Organization, IMO. It seeks to promote the recruitment, retention, and sustained employment of women in the maritime sector, raise the profile of women in maritime, strengthen IMO's commitment to Sustainable Development Goal 5, gender equality, and support work to address gender imbalance in the maritime industry. Join Kenya Maritime Authority, KMA, and the the Association of Women in Maritime in Eastern and Southern Africa, WOMESA, this Thursday, the 26th of May, 2022, from 9 a.m. to celebrate the inaugural International Day for Women in Maritime in Kisumu County in the Republic of Kenya under the theme, Women in Maritime, Opportunities and Milestones Achieved, only on NTV. Third most appearances in Juventus history. Nine Serie A titles and five Coppa Italia. Capped 116 times by Italy and winner of Euro 2020. That is some career for Giorgio Chiellini. And this is the Football Review. Makasembo by Lab Fund is a low-cost housing project in Kisumu City, offering one, two, and three-bedroom modern solar-powered apartments. Setting price for the apartments is Kenya shillings 1.8 million. For more information, contact us through the details on your screen. Welcome back to this live forum coming to you live from the county of Mombasa, which is about harnessing the blue economy and the great potential that's in it and seeing what opportunities there are and just understanding the deeper sense of what it has to hold and what it has to offer. And we're coming to you live from the Kenya Marine uh, and Fisheries Research Institute, which is in the county of Mombasa. And I'll just come to you, Prof. And when you speak to many researchers, many times they will tell you we usually give a lot of this quality information to governments for you know for implementation in policy but you hear researchers not just in terms of uh, for your institution but across the board some get some sense of frustration because some of their proposals do not see light of day either because of political expediency or just because maybe the the final decision makers are not as keen on the same um do you at times feel like you know as researchers that some of your efforts do not get as appreciated in terms of you know just giving some sense of direction for the country and the blue economy specifically uh, first allow me to dwell back to the decade again uh, the theme of the ocean decade that's the 10 years between now 2021 and 2030 the theme is the science we need for the oceans we want. The theme was not done by scientists, and I'll be coming back to your question. 
It was done by people who sit in the UN, uh, mostly our ministers and our president. And they have realized that uh, without science, we are not going far. Without facts, we are not going far. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, in the beginning, science, scientists have been speaking to themselves. We have been talking to ourselves, and uh, we have not been communicating. But I think this is going, is, is, uh, is, uh, is going to be a thing of the past. Based on the situation, uh, what is happening right now in the, in the world, and uh, we have seen the things to do with the climate change, and uh, I think my colleagues have alluded to it. And the science we have has shown us, and the science is not lying, that um, the ocean is at um, a very dangerous position. And uh, although in the beginning probably researchers felt they are frustrated, they are not communicating, again, we have been having training mechanism whereby the research is being packaged in such a way that it is able to reach uh, the policy uh, makers. Uh, like here, what we do in Kenya Marine, we have what we call the policy briefs. Uh, we, we, and uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, gotten um, people who can be able to interpret science, like um, the gentleman who is connected you to us here. He's our lead, um, uh, Ezekiel, he's our lead uh, person in terms of communication. Because sciences do not know how to communicate, including myself, probably. But uh, if we give a communication uh, and uh, uh, communication a strategy pers persons, they have been able to uh, sort of um, uh, make it a little bit better for the policymakers uh, to realize what we are doing. But as I said, as we are moving on, the policymakers have realized they need the science. And as scientists, we have realized we need to go down and be able to uh, make it simple for the policymakers to understand what we are doing. Because at the end of the day, it is the facts. It is the science. It is the knowledge. It is the information which you are generating, which will be very key in terms of policy, in terms of uh, management, in terms of all the guidelines you are going to have. Yes, we do feel frustrated early on, uh, but I think this is changing, as also things are changing. And also, our policy makers are also listening to us. Uh, early on, probably uh, nobody will listen to a professor uh, when he talks about uh, climate change. And uh, when I was in the office uh, with uh, my colleague here, we did allude to the idea of, um, allow me, Wangare Mathai. Uh, Wangare Mathai would shout at the top of our voice and tell us uh, probably the next war will be on water. And nobody would listen. We thought this is a mad, allow me to say, this is a mad woman. But down the road, uh, five years, 10 years down the road, we are seeing what is happening in the climate now, in the climate change. If we had listened to the science she was talking about, probably we will not be where we are in terms of clearing our forests, in terms of whatever we did. But now I think our, our scientists are listening, and we are very happy, like in Kenya. I don't want to emphasize without a fear of contradiction that our president himself has learned from the front in terms of accepting science. And uh, he has been very supportive in, in terms of science, like uh, the stock assessment we are doing uh, it was last done in 1980, and when we approached our president, he did give us money, almost to a tune of one billion, in terms of stock assessment in the ocean. Um, right now, we, we, we used to have uh, 20, 000, uh, to harvest uh, like uh, 26,000 metric tons of the o uh, in the ocean. We are now telling our policy makers, in the ocean we have almost 150,000 metric ton to 300,000 metric tons. They are listening to us, that is science we are talking about. And if you invest this, um, if you exploit this resource from the patri 5 billion we are getting now, the science is telling us you can now get uh, between 50 billion Kenya shillings to 100 billion Kenya shillings. Uh, that is a plus. When you start talking money to the, to the politicians, to our MPs, uh, to our ministers, is, 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 is start uh, listening. And I think they're listening to us. And uh, I want to thank my scientists who are here and other scientists. I think now we are communicating, and I'm very happy. And especially in the decade, uh, the next 10 years, we'd want to pump a lot of uh, science, but in a very systematic way to our policymakers. Because at the end of the day, if they did not listen, we don't get the money. Because they're the ones who give us the money. So I think we are not as frustrated as I used to be. Thank you. OK. And um, I'll just throw it again to the gentleman again. How do we move as a country from being very good with plans on paper, um, 
but not as good on the ground. You know, we, we, we are told that, you know, we are very good at planning and in terms of strategies, you know, you know, um, you know, blueprints and, and you know, long term plans, etc. that would, you know, big words I use revolutionize the industry or, you know, revamp the economy. But when it comes to implementation, that is where we kind of hit a wall. You know, what, what needs to be done to ensure that at least for, if you listen to, to the three of you at the list, speaking about the blue economy, the conviction you have, how do we make sure that this does, you know, does not fall you know, into the same trap as many other great things have been that end up just remaining on the shelf? Maybe I can pick it up first with you, Captain, as we come this way. Uh, one thing you, we must realize and appreciate is the fact that uh, implementing blue economy projects is very expensive, very expensive. So as we come up with programs, we must plan in such a way that we have funds available for the programs. As you say, there are programs which are planned for, but they are never implemented. Why? Because funds are not available. But the moment you do your proper feasibility study, then you do the proper costing and budget for it, and you get the approvals, then the projects will be implemented. I'll give you good examples, citing from Kenya Post Authority. Kenya Post Authority has undertaken quite massive, uh, uh, massive projects as far as modernization and expansion of the Port of Mombasa is concerned all to work towards assisting sustainable blue economy. We have come up with the uh, Dogokundu, Dogokundu uh, Special Economic Zone. This is an area where we are going to put up a, a, a bath together with, with facilities yeah, to enable the locals utilize the facility for uh, various types of economies. One, we're going to put up an LPG, the liquid uh, 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 natural gas terminal, which will assist the uh, present uh, LPG facility that we already have. Uh, and we, there are also plans uh, to have equivalent of what we have in, in Dubai so that we can have it uh, at, the, at the Port of Mombasa. And this will be done, of course, having uh, baths which have got deep drafts up to 15 meters and a big, big bath of uh, 300 meters. Apart from that, the Kenya Post Authority is also developing uh, Shimon port as a major uh, fishing port. This will enhance economy within that area and even further to northern Tanzania. But all these projects must be planned for and that's why uh, KPA has already embarked on these projects and as far as the Shimon port is concerned, we have already now started with the construction of the uh, the jetty, which is a space for bathing or parking of uh, fishing vessels. And then thereafter, we're going to put up a, a fish storage facility that will be utilized by, by the fishers. On top of that, uh, within the Port of Mombasa, uh, in order to enhance uh, the blue economy, plans are underway to revitalize or to have the services that we used to have before. This is the bunkering services. Bunkering services is whereby vessels will only come in purposely for refueling. And by so doing, we are gaining a lot because when a vessel comes in, then we are going to get uh, light juice, we are going to get piloted juice. So basically, marine charges for a vessel just coming in and going out, which is quite a lot of money. And the only way to do that is to make sure that the banking services are available. Uh, but of course, uh, as Kenya Post Authority, we have to work in collaboration with the Kenya 
revenue authority so that the services are actually availed uh, competitively with the other countries like uh, Mauritius and, and Seychelles. Um, uh, in addition to the expansion of uh, the Dogokund area, we also have uh, expanded the container terminal by adding extra capacity for the Port of Mombasa. The Port of Mombasa right now capacity is 1.6 million TUs per year. Last year, we handled 1.4 million TUs, which means we are almost hitting the capacity. And therefore, we have decided to expand the port by adding another bath. By so doing, we have provided an extra yard with an additional space of 4,450 TUs. So you add that to the present or uh, the current uh, yard space, we are now going to have 2.1 million TUs as capacity for the, for okay. the port, which is all working towards uh, promoting and sustaining the blue economy. Okay. Maybe Daniel could tell us what, in your view, would need to happen so that we don't get caught up in this, hitting this wall when it comes to implementation of all these, you know, great gems of advice that you give to the various stakeholders and the same for the gentlemen here. What, what needs to be done to ensure that this implementation actually bears the fruit it's actually expected to? Thank you. <coughs> I, I think the main issue actually uh, for us as technocrats is mainly to advise the governments and as part of that advice, we need not just to advise, we need also to sensitize the policy makers. We also need not just to sensitize, but also to lobby. Because the main problem is that some of the policy makers do not understand what needs to be done. And they may look at a particular proposal in terms of how much are we putting this, as opposed to what is the output of this initiative. So. I think what needs to be done uh, by organizations like the ones we are, we are leading in this forum is to put that effort to sensitize uh, both the political people and also the technical people who are at the policy level. As once they buy in, then I believe that they will be able to avail resources, the funds which my colleagues have mentioned about, because there is no plan or policy that will go without the budget. So allocation of that budget is critical. And those people will only allocate that budget once they are able to see the impact of those plans. Doing a proposal, doing a plan, without that uh, understanding at that level might not be enough. But fortunately, <coughs> uh, I think now for the blue economy, it is important that, uh, and we are lucky at this generation, that the, the climate itself is teaching everybody, whether you are a politician, a technocrat, that something needs to be done at the climate level and at the blue economy level. So that if we don't act as mankind, then we are digging our own grave in our very near future. And that, I think, is a big plus for this generation. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, I would want to concur with my colleague here. One, awareness is very key. Uh, leading from the front by the, the, the politicians, uh, the policy makers is very key. And allow me to give examples, especially in Kenya. And as I said earlier on, uh, the political will in Kenya is very good. And uh, it's led none other than the, His Excellency the President. And allow me to, to, to give you one or two examples which uh, His Excellency the President has led from the front. Uh, like uh, in our law, uh, fisheries management, it says that um, you are supposed to learn like 30% of the catch back in Kenya, uh, back on our waters after you are fished. But uh, there was no place to, to land the fish. And uh, uh, when, as, as my colleague said, 
we, we, we made this aware to our politicians and um, Liwatoni is, is, is now coming up, uh, uh, having a place to bath, I mean, for the ship. There's a cold room. And uh, the, then this 30% uh, of the fish when it's landed, of course, you know the lipo effect in terms of uh, what happens to Mama Karangas and the rest in Mombasa and, and the coastal region. We also, uh, through again the political goodwill, there will be the, the port of Lamu, the port of uh, Shimoni, which will also be having a, a, a fisheries up. Again, we have been able to convince, and uh, the politicians have also seen the need of also have involving our own Kenyans. And again, that's what I'm seeing from the front of the uh, presidency. We were able to get funds to train young Kenyans so that uh, the crew members all aboard our ships or any ship which is uh, flagged in Kenya or licensed in Kenya are Kenyans, are young Kenyans from uh, coast, are Kenyans from uh, interior of this country. Again, we need to do systematic way of um, trying to convince our politicians. Because as my colleague said, at the end of the day, uh, blue economy is very expensive. It's about budget. Researchers, we don't, uh, we don't have the budget. The budget comes from the policymakers, comes from our MPs, comes from the government. But uh, again, as you said, climate is teaching us that uh, if we don't act now, because science is showing us there is danger if we don't act now. The politicians are starting to realize, yes, um, we cannot keep on uh, closing our eyes. Uh, our, our economy is in danger. And uh, what science is telling us is, is true. And they have started realizing, yes, we need to listen to scientists. We need uh, to help them so that we can help ourselves. And we are seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, impetus from this, uh, th this level, starting with our, with our ministers, starting with our, uh, our PSEs. When you talk about things to, to do blue economy, we are not getting all the money, but we are getting a lot of support, uh, which we would not have gotten probably a couple of years ago. And uh, I think this is, a, is, is, is very positive uh, in terms of the development of the blue economy in this country. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that, Prof. And um, we take another short break on this live broadcast, and when we come back, we'll have a few more points to raise here, as well as pick some questions from our audience here uh, who may be having some concerns or questions or clarifications or just points to raise when we come back on this live broadcast. Coming to you live from the county of Mombasa. Stay with us. As a mother, I have to do my duties in the house. It forces me to send her to the river because I have no alternative. Piaura okbe, lerbe dokole. Otuo ni kesh piaura. Otuo okodi school Japan chunye chandole. If children had water close by, they won't be sick. They won't be distracted because the water is clean. First sign of pain, you need a solution that you can trust. Try Panadol Advance. With Panadol's Optizod formula, the tablet absorbs quickly and starts providing fast and effective pain relief you can trust. Try Panadol Advance. Almost 250,000 people die on the road in Africa each year. Follow these safe steps and help save lives. Pedestrians, avoid using electronic devices. Stay on sidewalks. At a road crossing, stop. Look both ways, listen, and then cross. So when you're on the roads, follow these safe steps and help save lives. We all have a role to play in road safety. Together, let's make Africa's road safer. Every year, Kenya collects an average of 104 billion shillings worth of revenue from excise duty levied on products such as beer, cigarettes, airtime, bottled water, as well as services such as financial transactions. 
This means that out of every 100 shillings raised in tax revenue, 7 shillings are attributed to excise tax. As the role of excise tax in revenue mobilization grows, questions are emerging as to whether the state is overreaching as far as excise tax is concerned. What is the role of excise tax in revenue mobilization and curbing consumption of harmful products? Does higher excise tax always translate into the desired revenue targets for the government? Is the widening scope of excise tax in Kenya having unintended and favorable impact on the business environment? This Thursday starting 7.30 p.m. with the help of a panel of experts, NTV Kenya hosts a live conversation on excise tax and Kenya's business environment. is easy. This easy. Nice. You even took it with a smile. What about yours? boldness. Celebrate the skin you're in and dress with confidence with Nivea Nourishing Cocoa Body Lotion. The triple layered care of deep moisture serum, precious cocoa butter and vitamin E enriches your skin for 48 hours. Choose to wear your skin with pride with Nivea. And welcome back to this great conversation on the blue economy. Once again, coming to you live from the county of Mombasa, just at the edge of the Indian Ocean. Quite beautiful, and as you can imagine, Mombasa is ordinarily hot, but by virtue of being at this position, it's quite cool at least, so I can bear the heat in my tie. And just some of the things we've been discussing about harnessing the blue economy include um, what value it has to the, to the country's economy, what... O what lie in this economy and a lot more. We also look at um, what have been the steps made since the 2018 forum, um, which was held in Kenya, which was a landmark and, you know, a significant one for the country, um, which the gentlemen on my panel have ably responded to. And aside from that, we also have looked at what it means for the region in terms of where Kenya sits in regards to the blue economy's performance compared to the other, to its neighbors in the region. And, you know, the gentlemen who are on the ground, or should I say on the water on, in this, are actually saying that Kenya is in a leading position, which is a good thing. And, um, you know, the Director General uh, here has reiterated that it's, a lot of it has come because of the political goodwill that has come with uh, the President himself being very keen on this. And this has been reiterated across um, the panel. And so before I pick a few questions and, co or, and or comments from our audience here, um, I just want to bring in, uh, Prof, start with you. What are some of the things that you're doing to, you know, empower the local communities? You know, uh, you've mentioned about um, this, for instance, the jobs that have come up, which are some sort of the direct. What other activities are there that are being done? Because you can't employ the whole community, but there are many other things that you can do. What else is being done? Um, thank you, thank you. Once, once again, um, there's the training we are doing um, uh, in terms of, uh, as I said again, from the presidency, in terms of enabling the youth uh, along the coast. The 5,000 we have to train in the next five years. We are training almost uh, now, uh, we are th uh, 300. That is number one. Uh, I, I think uh, the other issue which I alluded to earlier on is in terms of enabling the community themselves uh, be self-reliant. And you have worked very closely with the, with the communities. Uh, I'll pick one community somewhere in Kilifi. We call it uh, Dabaso. Um, 
uh, through again a uh, project uh, like uh, what we used to call KCDP, that was Kenya Coast Development uh, Project. Again, through the government uh, initiative, uh, we are able to train uh, communities, one, how to, how to farm uh, fish, how to uh, use cages to farm fish, uh, ecotourism. So this team in Dabaso, what they are doing, they are young, they are young men who have come together through the assistant of Kenya Marine, the assistant of government uh, entities here and there. They are able to conserve the, uh, the mangroves where they are. They have got a um, uh, um, uh, sort of a restaurant inside the mangroves. So you walk through the mangroves, uh, there's a walkway. Uh, so one, there's ecotourism. Two, there's conservation. And the three, there's a restaurant. So and they are able to earn their living that way. So it's not, a, it's not, it's not, it's not fishing. Is maintaining the environment, and you see when you maintain the environments like the mangroves, uh, you, you'll be told that it has almost triple, uh, triple advantages uh, by maintaining mangroves. One, we have the biodiversity uh, in terms of uh, uh, saving, uh, sustaining the biodiversity of fish and other 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 organisms. Two, the communities um, are, are benefiting, and if you go to like a place like Gazi, when you talked about um, uh, uh, climate change the mangroves are very key because mangroves normally absorb five to ten times the amount of carbon compared to, tra to, to, uh, to the terrestrial trees. Uh, so we, we, we are enabling the, the, the community. And I said yesterday we were somewhere in semi-arid area of Kilifi, uh, a place known as Bamba, uh, whereby the, there were no runes until, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, you remember the song uh, Bamba ni Machero, for those who, who remember that song. And uh, I think the His Excellency the President also sang after he commissioned uh, the loan to Mbamba, opening up to that place. And now the community there through our initiative and other uh, stakeholders, they are able to farm fish and be able to sustain themselves in terms of um, the knowledge you have given them. So there are very many uh, uh, aspects of brew economy, uh, which Kenya Marine as an institution, of course partnering with other government bodies, we have been able to impact on the local community so that they can be able to self-sustain themselves. And it's not only on the coast. Uh, uh, the, the, the government, uh, uh, through other uh, interventions, like uh, at the coast, there is now what we call the, the Kenya Marine Fisheries and Socioeconomic uh, uh, Project. Uh, it's, it's a project of about 10 billion Kenya shillings. And it's mostly focused on the fisheries aspects. Uh, again, uh, it's government. Uh, and then also in the inland, you know, blue economy is not only in the other coast. When you talk about blue species, we are talking about all the waters from the coast and to the inland. There is also another project which is very key in 15 counties of, of, of Kenya. Uh, we call it um, aquaculture business uh, dev uh, a business development uh, project. It's, a, it's, a, it's about uh, 13 or so billion Kenya sharing. And the idea here again is to make farming of fish uh, 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 like a business. And uh, again, our researchers here and the uh, Kenya Fishery Service, we have taught uh, farmers on how to farm fish uh, in a more business manner. And uh, this is creating jobs, this is creating opportunities. So these are some of the opportunities we have in the blue economy. And not only at the coast, we have also some in the inland waters. And we want to thank the government for the effort and for the, for the impact it has earned. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And in the event that anybody has a question, you could just let us know so that uh, you could come to the frontier so that we can be able to get your uh, your question properly. Uh, you'll just alert us so that our team can bring uh, guide you to the front. So you could just do the same. And as we get um, someone, anyone with a comment or question, uh, Captain, one thing that um, again because you mentioned the one who mentioned that you know implementing the blue economy and its projects is a very expensive affair. Um, the thing is, in Kenya, a lot of these expensive things sadly tag along with them corruption. How do we avoid again this corruption eating into the great things that have been spoken of here? Um, it's almost, this is pretty much like a follow up to the question of not being a blueprint nation. How do we avoid corruption, um, you know, eating into the potential and the promise of the blue economy? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, th that's very simple. The best way to avoid corruption is to follow the procurement rules and guidelines. 
Remember, as I said before, when you come up with programs, you do the feasibility study, you do the budgeting, you get the approval, and you implement the projects. If you follow all those procedures correctly, which culminate into going into the, procuring, the, the correct procurement process, you'll never go into corruption activities. So the best thing is just follow the correct procedures uh, so that then you implement your projects timely. And uh, having said that, l let me also just uh, enrich on what a professor indicated about um, Wananchi, Wananchi Marine and, uh, and, and uh, Port of Shimoni. Uh, all these activities that support the blue economy will actually run on the oil industry. They see as now we implement the blue economy, sustain the blue economy, will make the sea very busy. Uh, all that will run on the oil industry. Now, Kenya Post Authority, having looked at that, embarked on a major project that developed a new oil terminal that is going to enhance the capacity of oil storage or petroleum product storage within, not only within the country, but within the region. That is, that's very key uh, because as you plan to sustain the economy, you, you must be ready. You must be ready to have all the resources available. The new, the new uh, Kipev oil terminal too is an island facility which has got, is designed for four bars. But as it is, as it is right now, has got three bus ready to be utilized by the petroleum oil tanker vessels. Now, at any given time, we shall be able to handle three vessels which will be able to concurrently uh, discharge petroleum products. That way, we'll now have enough stock as far as petroleum products are concerned. And of course, it will now stabilize the pump prices in the country and even in the region. So I, I'm saying this because uh, at Kenya Post Authority, we have adopted one key strategy that we keep ahead of the demand uh, before the demand comes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I can see we have a question from one of the members of our audience. I just request you to step into, oh, he's okay there? Okay, so maybe you could just, um, Introduce yourself, tell us uh, which institution you are from, and then uh, you could shoot your question. Asante uh, sana. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Cosmas Munga. I'm from uh, Technical University of Mombasa, uh, an institution that is neighboring Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute here. Uh, TUM is a university of excellence in science and technology. And uh, uh, my question will be uh, more on training, capacity building. Uh, in this era of uh, decade of ocean science, uh, TUM has appropriate programs, uh, very relevant for blue economy. For example, we are offering uh, degree programs in uh, marine resource management, fisheries and oceanography, maritime and other related causes. Now, the, the question I, I want to pose to you three gentlemen is uh, Professor Njiru has explained very well that there's a lot of training that has been taking place uh, in, related, in relation to the blue economy sector. But the situation in the university seems to be different, uh, especially for the degree programs. We are having a lot of challenges recruiting students. For the past four years or five, we've been seeing a decreasing trend in terms of intake, uh, students pursuing marine and fisheries related programs. So the question is, what is the problem? Uh, from your talk, it seems very brilliant, very, very uh, good sector. Uh, the, future, the, 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 the question is, how will it be 
uh, if we don't have the capacity, we are concentrating on uh, training the low caliber jobs. How about scientists? So what I want to hear from you, uh, three gentlemen, is uh, can we uh, 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 explain to, to, the, to the viewers and to the public that uh, the, the kind of opportunities you have, apart from fish farming, uh, communities benefiting from uh, restoration projects, mangroves, what other opportunities are there for people, for students to be attracted so that they can come to the university and train to be experts? Thank right. you very much. Th thank you very much for that, um, Cosmas. And Prof, I'll just let you out take that. I think some of them you had addressed earlier on in terms of the other opportunities, but he points out a disconnect between what we are saying and what they are seeing in the institutions. We're not having as many people, you know, enrolling for these courses. What is the problem? Um, yes, um, my other leg is also, again, also in the university. I'm a faculty member. Uh, um, and uh, yes, indeed, um, there's a disconnect uh, in terms of um, people who are going for, for degrees in, the, in these areas, in fisheries and other areas. But, but I think uh, as uh, we see in terms of politicians and uh, politicians coming, tagging along with us, I think is awareness, uh, is awareness creation, is education. Because what we are going to, what's going to happen, blue economy is going to boom in Kenya. And it's going to boom, and I can tell you for, the, for a fact. Take that to the bank. But you are going to miss those critical people. Uh, remember there was a time when uh, in, this, in this country, uh, science was the only in thing. We forgot about the arts. And then we had a problem with sciences. And uh, it, that's exactly what's going to happen as we move on in terms of expression of blue economy. I think it's upon us, all the stakeholders who are involved, including ourselves, including everybody else, to try and convince our young children, our young daughters, our young whatever, taking a science in uh, a degree in fisheries, taking a science in, uh, in uh, maritime is, is, is good because jobs are there uh, at, the, uh, 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 at the end of the day. Our young children want to see uh, uh, a job tomorrow, uh, but probably as we move on and they see this is opening up, I'm, I'm very sure that um, we are going to be seeing more and more of our young people taking up these degrees. So cre uh, creation of awareness, talking to our young, uh, our young Kenyans, I, I think that's the only way uh, to go, uh, I, I submit. All right, thank you very much. And I think that's um, a good response. I don't know if there's any other question from the audience, um, but but I, I also want to just pose the same to Bona Kiage, just in regards to the same from what you see across the region, you know, because um, you also interact with the different organizations, government, CTC across the region. Is this a shared concern that, or do we have some countries know that are having more uptake of you know young people studying um, blue economy related courses thank you I, I think the the problem of uh, young people not uh, understanding the, the importance of the potential of blue economy cuts across it is not uh, only a Kenyan problem but actually, as professors say, this is something that we need to do deliberately as a region to talk to our people so that they can be able to see the potential that is there uh, in the blue economy. We, we cannot blame them because even the majority of us are now just try to catch up with the concept. Many people also might not be aware, even in grown-ups, of the potentials that is there in the blue economy. So for those of us who are lucky to have that knowledge, we have a lot of work to do just to sensitize people and to create environments that will be able to attract them in the industry. For instance, I know one of the problems we have been having uh, in shipping and logistics is uh, what we call the man hours. You go to Bandari Academy, for instance, you do your, your course, but before you can be recognized to be able to operate international, internationally, then you need to have certain 
done certain hours as a kind of practicals. That has been a challenge because as a region, we do not have seeing going vessels where we can offer internships for our people to practice. So this is an issue which I th I'm sure the government, we have advised the governments, the governments have taken these issues and actually I know one of the reasons behind the five four of the, the Kenya National Shipping Line is to create that capacity so that once you are trained at Bandari College, then Kenya National Shipping Line through maybe uh, collaborations and uh, networks with other shipping lines can be able to offer uh, internships for these people. So once people are able to see we train to the so-and-so, is now flying between Mombasa and Dar es Salaam or, or uh, Dubai, then others will be attracted. But as long as that is lucky, then we are not likely to see people coming to the industry. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we have another question from one of our audience members. Maybe so, just introduce yourself and briefly just ask your question. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. David Mirera uh, from Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. Uh, I think from the panelists we have gotten uh, information that the, the open sea or the, uh, the blue economy space uh, is actually interacting between several things. We have seen fishing, transport, we have seen aquaculture, we have seen tourism, uh, we have seen conservation and several other aspects that are using the, the blue economy space. Maybe I could request the panelists to shed more light on what the government is doing to plan this sea the, uh, the utilization of the ocean space so that we don't have conflicts uh, as we try to invest and utilize this open space. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Prof, you could take it up. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mirera. Um, yes, indeed, um, the ocean could be a time bomb. If we don't plan, uh, of course, you see, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. But the government has already sees this uh, uh, issue and uh, as, a, as an institution, it has mandated us uh, with other, with other institutions to do what we call marine spatial planning. Marine spatial planning is where by we have uh, all the blue spaces in the water are uh, marked for certain activities so that if it's shipping, we know where shipping should be done. If it is mariculture, we know where mariculture will be done. Uh, if it is fishing, we know where fishing is done. Uh, if it's conservation, we know conservation is done. So the whole ocean uh, is mapped. Uh, but by the way, um, I, I want to mention that uh, our territorial waters uh, span to uh, about 245,000 square kilometers, uh, which is about 42% uh, of the land mass of Kenya. The land mass of Kenya is about 580,000 square kilometers. So actually, a half of our land is in the ocean. So, and that's why the government has seized this uh, occasion to try and plan because as we are all sp speaking here, the next economy, the next frontier is probably going to be the ocean. And uh, we need to plan as, as we move on. And marine spatial planning will be one of the key areas as, uh, as government uh, to allow uh, to reduce conflict of, uh, of, of, of resources. And, uh, and, and I think uh, the government is, uh, is aware about this. All right, thank you very much. So I'd just like to, um, as we draw to an end, because we're running out of time, just ask our panelists to just give a closing remark very briefly um, on this whole conversation about harnessing the blue economy and the great potential that's there. And I'll begin with you, Captain, as we come this way, uh, as we just do a brief closing remark. Thank you very much. Uh, we have all agreed that the next big economy is going to be the ocean economy which is the blue economy. Um, we have had many programs coming up, uh, maritime programs coming up. The most important thing now is for us to move from uh, a maritime program nation to a maritime nation, a leading maritime nation. And I'm sure under the leadership of the of the PS Shipping and Maritime, my, Madam PS Cargido, uh, uh, we should be able to be a leading maritime nation in this region, and not only in this region, all the way 
up to the southern part of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I just want to appeal to Kenyans that uh, we are now more enlightened in terms of blue economy. Let us take the advantage of exploiting this uh, big resource, and not just as a Kenyan, but as a region. We need to look ourselves as part of the bigger region. Let's prepare our capacity not to serve only Kenya, but the region. Because as the panelists have said here, there's a big potential in the region and the country. The younger people come to the industry, build capacity, and take advantage of this ship before it leaves to other places. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. As, as, as I, my colleagues have said, I think the next frontier in terms of the uh, economy of this country is blue economy. Uh, again, we, we, we as Kenya Marine, we are, our doors are open in terms of information, in terms of investment. I said we can convert the economy of fisheries from the current 5 million to 100 billion Kenya shillings for our budget uh, processes. Uh, I would want to take uh, this opportunity first and foremost to thank our presidency in terms of what we have done in terms of stock assessment for giving us money, in terms of training uh, and uh, allowing us to do other projects uh, from his uh, big office. Our minister has also been very supportive. Our peers has been very supportive. My researchers, our researchers have been very supportive. Stakeholders have been very supportive. And I think this is what we, we, we want to see as we move on as a country. Uh, if we move together, I think uh, there's no limitation. We can convert the economy of this country to bypass that one of, uh, allow me to say, countries like Seychelles, which is almost the size of uh, Mombasa, but the economy is probably 10 times, uh, five times that of Kenya. Why, why? Why can't we be better than Mauritius and in Seychelles? We have got bigger, bigger water, and I think I want to pass it to the politicians. Please give us more money so that we can be able to give you research, um, findings, and we'll be able to, <laughs> to generate more money from uh, where we are as Kenya Marine. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you very much, um, Professor. Yes, thank you very much also to our audience. And uh, once again, just to thank my panelists for their great insights, um, beginning with Professor James Njiru, who is the Director General of the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute, which is where we are coming to you live from. Uh, next to him is Daniel Kiange, who is the Secretary General of the Intergo Intergovernmental Standing Committee on Shipping, or ISCOS. Thank you for joining us as well. And we have, last but definitely not least, Captain Geoffrey Namadoa, who's the harbor master as well as the general manager of marine operations at the Kenya Ports Authority. And we thank you all as well, uh, our audience, for being part of this and just for your contribution, for just listening and just being part of this. Thank you all for, thank you for hosting us, Prof. And it definitely is a great night. Uh, it's a great place to stop it. We've got a lot more insight in regards to the blue economy and how we can harness it. Those of you who feel there's an opportunity for you, you should register in the school so that we won't have Cosmas coming to say that they hardly have any people who are registering for these courses at their university and the different uh, uh, the other different um, tertiary institutions which offer the same. And MPs, you've had the DG. He wants more money so that they can give you uh, better better research and more information and insights that can help us harness the potential in this great economy. My name is Dan Mwangi. Thank you for being with us through this live through this live uh, forum that we've been having here in the county of Mombasa. We'll be ha we'll be having a lot more to look into. The conversation goes on online. Our hashtag has been Blue Economy KE. Continue giving your insights, and we shall be looking at them. Thanks for joining us. My name is Dan Mwangi. Have yourselves a good night.